good evening. Uh, uh, Dr. Penner and I uh, welcome you to the fourth meeting of Kynet Revisited. The fourth meeting in uh, the fifth year that we've been doing this. And tonight we'll be um, talking um, about the uh, proposed kind of heritage um, museum. <clears throat> but before we get to the program, I just want to uh, mention that the uh, there's some information at the uh, front desk when you signed in. That uh, one is uh, information about a Winter Wonderland at Wolf Lake Festival on January 19th. Another one is um, our Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative annual membership meeting on July, uh, on January 17th, and that's at Calumet College um, at St. Joseph. Um, and then there is um, uh, just a list of the upcoming programs uh, for uh, January and February. Um, and I just want to check, does anyone have any announcements of upcoming events that, that they're involved in and they would like to um, inform others? You guys really need four and five. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is right. Um, but anyway, tonight um, we've had uh, several problems. One. Um, Madeline Tudor, who's been uh, uh, conducting the curators meetings, um, uh, is ill and could not make it. And um, I'm checking out everybody. Hey, you know what's been going on with the curators? Um, and that's just one of several groups that have been meeting. Um, and I might, um, um, so I'm going to, Call on um, to to, um, to give, um, give exactly what um, Madeline is talking That's about. That's right. Yes, and I'll try to play Madeline best as I can. Um, so I'm Julie Zazada from the Cedar Lake Historical Association, and I am one of the member organizations of County Met Curators, and we're a group of you know museums and entities um, who are preserving history throughout the County Met region and meeting together monthly to talk about similar things like we're going to be talking about tonight. But the main project that we're working on as a subgroup of CHP is this exhibit that the Field Museum is spearheading. It's going to be an exhibit that curates artifacts and objects from three different sites, or will be set up at three different sites, out at Coleman, and then we'll be out at the Gary Library, and then I, I think Valparaiso University, I think, is the fourth so this exhibit will travel for six months at a time throughout the region and end up back at the Field Museum, I think it's in 2021. can't remember the exact date. I think it's February of 2021. So it will, like I said, we will each member organizations be able to contribute, contribute artifacts to the traveling exhibit in each of our counties. And then everything goes back to the field and the field will add more artifacts to an overall county so that's the thing that we're hyper-focused on right now, is figuring out what artifacts are going to go in, how are we going to design this exhibit, what are going to be the opening pieces that tie everything together across all three sites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we welcome any of you to join the fund if you have any interest in helping us plan this. Um, I am certain that Michael can forward an email from Madeline that kind of gives our meeting schedule and things like that. Um, but again, uh, we just basically we're, we're focused on helping to tell the telling that story um, by all coming together, right, and presenting this, for right now, presenting this exhibit. So that's the main focus for right now. I think there will be more networking as we go along and after this exhibit and expires. Um, that will be the main thrust is staying connected and moving regularly so that we can share resources and throughout the region. So if you have any questions afterwards, I'll stay around and answer them for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Gosh, that was great. Now, uh, are there other groups represented uh, that would like us to 
mention what the group is and what you can up to. Maybe uh, 15 seconds. Okay. My name is Bob Meyer. I'm with the Northwest Indiana Steel Heritage Project. We, uh, we don't have a location yet, but we're collecting artifacts and working towards a <coughs> regional steel industry themed museum and learning center. And how large a group is that that is meeting? Small. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll keep it at that. <laughs> but you want to. Be, become larger, right? Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Any other groups? Okay. Uh, my name is Joe Coates. I'm the university archivist at Purdue University Northwest. Um, we're currently working on two projects. Um, one of them is a comprehensive history of the North Central campus, which no longer, uh, Purdue North Central no longer exists because of our unification. So. It's a student-driven book that we're writing with uh, photos and timelines and everything else. And then for 2020, we're going to be talking to uh, 20 retirees from Purdue North Central and Purdue Calumet and then put together an oral history uh, project on that so we can get the point of view of faculty, like longtime employees, talking about the changes that they saw at the university changes that they've seen in the region since mid-late 40s on. Um, and that's what we have going on. So. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Okay. Well, I guess I'll introduce myself since probably too good of a group. Yeah. Yes, please do. Um, yeah, Kevin Brown from the Wyoming Historical Society. I've been working uh, with Madeline and Julie and the University of Kelly Mint uh, creators. So, um, a lot, but and you just had a meeting last night at New Island? Yeah. Is yeah. That okay. Um, anything that you wanted to add to what Julie said? No, she wrapped it up very nice. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm John Morovich. I'm with the Whiting Robertsdale Historical Society. We just established a website, and uh, it has a lot of information on it about the, the history of Whiting and Robertsdale. And we collected tons of artifacts over the history of the organization. And unfortunately, we don't have a space where we can display them all. Uh, what we're doing right now is putting a lot of that information, including pictures of the artifacts, on the website. Uh, there's something new on the website virtually every week, if not every other day. Uh, so I encourage you to look at it. It's wrhistoricalsociety.com. So are you looking for a physical space? We are. We're the, uh, we've been talking with the, the mayor has been uh, coming up with plans for perhaps uh, after they get the mascot museum open right. uh, to start looking for, and they, there have been some discussions about having a history museum in Whiting okay. on 119th Street. Yeah, okay. Would that be at the same similar location as the mascot? Uh, just down the street. We do have a building in downtown Whiting. We just don't have space right, to display right. things. Yeah. So they're actually talking about maybe expanding into the uh, the lots next to us to create a museum. Okay. Um, while we're talking, I, I'm just thinking that it might be a good idea if everybody introduce themselves so we know who's at the table. And uh, why don't we start here and just go around the with you. Yeah, well, Walter Skiba. I'm, I'm with uh, Kelly McCallum. Sherry Meyer, Kelly McCallum Partnership Vice President, and I'm with Insights. Mm -hmm. Dan Hansen. <coughs> Dan Hansen. No affiliation. I'm just an artist at Walmart. Well, and, 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 uh, and you exhibited at Green of the Arts, which was held at Kelly McCallum College, which is really important. Okay, uh, Julie. Julie Zazada from the Cedar Lake Historical Association. Bob Meyer with the uh, Northwest Indiana Steel Heritage Project. Kevin Brown again, Wild Historical Society. Joe Coates again, uh, Purdue Northwest. Jim Jarecki of Chicago Maritime Museum. Chuck Berry with Chicago Maritime Museum. 
Valerie Kenyon from the college. John Morovich, uh, Whiting Robertsdale Historical oh. Society. Sarah. Sarah Coulter, Tiger Collaborative. Amy McCormick. Uh, Joan Fasanella, Lake Harden Harvest. Paul Petritus, uh, former Chicago historical, former Ridge historical, Chicago history guy living in Pullman. Mark Schilling, retired. Um, I live right on Wolf Lake. Cynthia O'Gorick, uh, public historian and uh, local history author. Diane Pugh, I'm on the board of the Calumet Heritage Partnership, and I work with their Steel Heritage Archives. And then our panelists, Michael. I'm Michael Longan, uh, Professor of Geography at Valparaiso University and President of the Calumet Heritage Partnership. Kevin Murphy, we're the people who do the camera work that records Michael's session, so we're also operating the three websites that we're going to be talking about in part of the presentation tonight, covering the regional, hist uh, not history, but regional events, and some regional history as well. We're waiting on the third panelist, uh, Pat Wachowski, and uh, she may be caught up in traffic. But, um, pardon? At bridge, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we'll, uh, we'll start uh, with Fowler. Oh, Mary, you want to introduce yourself? We you just went around the room. Okay. I don't know if you can uh, do it, but we missed one person behind the camera. Well, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but who are you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so, um, Um, the reason we're here tonight is a uh, email exchange that was going on between Pat Wisniewski and Kevin Murphy in the spring. And they were talking about the Heritage Museum, you know, and they had a lot of questions and very low answers. And so I kind of, um, I don't know how I got into this, but anyway, so I interrupted and I said, well, why don't we talk about this at a Calumet Revisited Forum? This is how things have developed. So um, they said, yeah, it's a great idea. So um, and then I kind of brought in uh, Larry McClellan uh, into the conversation. And um, he's not here tonight, but he will be here uh, the first Tuesday of February because he'll be talking about the Underground Railroad and connecting the link, link between Chicago and Michigan City, which there's um, up to this point very little information. Um, and I believe he's uh, either just published a book or maybe it's still pending, if someone can correct me on um, um, on the Underground Railroad in Illinois. And um, he'll be joined in February by Jeannie uh, Reagan Dinius, um, who works for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, but who's the expert on um, the Underground Railroad in Indiana. And she's been researching that. She's not researching it now, but over the years she's re researched it. And um, I've, uh, and she's appeared at other uh, Calumet Revisited forums. So, um, and hopefully she'll join uh, Larry in uh, in February. So I um, want to begin the pro uh, program with Kevin, uh, and let me get your um, information. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. While preparing for this evening's session. I recall an item that I had written in 1993 for a celebration of the Northwest Indiana Excellence in Theater Foundation's then youthful accomplishments. That essay, Honoring Sculptors in Smoke, 
paid tribute to actors who create characters' lives before our eyes in real time. Such creations are works of art that can never be experienced again without some sort of recording device. While it can be powerful art, it is art that is lost immediately upon its creation, like a thunderclap. Searching for that essay among the vast area of digital information in our computer system, I came upon another forgotten note that I believe relates to tonight's subject. It was written on November 11, 2014, and here it is. I recently found it difficult to reconstruct the workshop plan that I had created in 1979. That experience led me to wonder how accurate historians may be in their reconstruction of the past from fragmentary information when I found it difficult to reconstruct 32-year-old plans that are my original work, not fragmentary evidence that some present-day historian is trying to interpret from a centuries-old event or a series of events that may have taken place in an alien culture. So how much do we really know about the lives of those who have gone before us? And I thought, yeah, that, that kind of connects with what we've been worried about. Ironically, and this relates to that too, I think, the Internet site on which that item appeared no longer exists. More creative work gone up in some form of digital smoke. How then are we to preserve such fragile records? That's one of the reasons we're here tonight. Those experiences and the powerful influence of the Calumet Ecological Park Association, SEPA, on us in the 1980s and 90s contributed strongly to our becoming involved in community video work because we did not want important regional events that we could capture to be lost in the same kinds of smoke. That desire led us to create the Spotlighting Southeast Chicago and Northwest Indiana website to enable us to provide as much current information as possible about the groups, resources, and sites that we were able to identify and to build an online source for regional researchers and visitors to the area. In addition to strongly opposing environmental irresponsibility among industries during that era, SEPA had chosen to also undertake positive projects, which eventually led to the restoration of important segments of our local environment, such as Eggers Grove Park, among other projects that they had championed and staffed for years, helping to drive back invasive species and to restore native species in such areas. While time and economics delayed the actual creation of the ecological park that had been envisioned by SEPA, we were inspired to offer a conceptual and graphic suggestion of the park digitally using our three websites to present segments of the whole. We've indicated what the websites are on this other handout. So basically that's my story. What we've tried to do is kind of foreshadow what we think might be a digital museum with the things that we've been able to put on the, on the internet, with the work that we're doing with the cameras here. Tonight's session will be on Michael's site, it'll be on our website, so that there is some kind of record of what at least we're thinking about and how we plan to get it done. That's it, right? Okay. We have some slides to show related to the site, but I think that if the, those of you who were interested may have taken links to the site that you can actually Visit on your iPhones, your iPads, things like, or other tablets and phones too, smartphones. Okay. This is the home page, and you, those from the immediate area will recognize Wolf Lake and some kind of us who are working on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the, the uh, I am president of the County Heritage Partnership, and uh, a lot of you, for many of you, uh, the story I'm going to tell tonight about what our activists are might be familiar. Uh, many of you are members or board members, or heard heard it talked about before, but uh, many of you, some of you may not have. Um, one of the our major projects for the last few years has been the. Uh, um, creation of a feasibility study to create a Calumet National Heritage Area, which is, uh, and, and we've worked with the Field Museum and with our partners, the Calumet Collaborative, uh, to make that um, a reality. Uh, we completed, uh, now a, a heritage area is a, uh, let's see there, is, is a region recognized by Congress that has natural, cultural, historic, and recreational resources that all combine to uh, form a cohesive and nationally significant landscape. 
uh, and uh, it's a distinctive nationally significant landscape. And the uh, National Heritage Area Program is administered by the National Park Service. And uh, these, these are not parks, but they are instead lived in landscapes uh, that, uh, that are administered. The heritage area itself is administered by local private organizations or, or governments. There's a, a local coordinating entity. It's not controlled by the federal government. And so there's a lot of local participation in, in heritage areas. And um, they do receive matching funding from the federal government. So we completed our feasibility study and, um, and we got the National Park Service to tell us that, uh, that we had met all their criteria for feasibility. They don't tell you that uh, your feasibility, they don't tell, it's, tell you it's feasible, they, they give you some, because uh, they, don't, they don't make the decision, Congress makes the decision. And right now we are working to get legislation written and introduced into Congress, which could happen very, very soon or maybe not. So we just have to convince Congress that uh, we are a nationally significant area and uh, we should have some money. And then uh, once we get the money, we have to match the money. So uh, there's a lot of work yet to do. Uh, and we've just kicked off with our uh, uh, Heritage Conference, a, a management planning process. And some of you may be hearing uh, more of that in the near future. Um, but uh, we're not waiting for Congress uh, to create a heritage area. We are. Uh, we are working with the uh, uh, Field Museum and the Climate Collaborative and uh, all your organizations uh, to, to be a heritage area. I think the, the uh, Climate Curators is a shining example of that. Um, I'm just really tickled by all the cool stuff that, that, that I went to one meeting and it was just great to see the energy and the interest and their meeting like once or twice a week, uh, some of them with their groups and it's just, uh, a, that's what a heritage area is about, and so I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, it seems to me the promotion of the creation of a regional heritage museum is something that should could be a central activity for uh, a heritage area, and uh, and um, uh, that is the kind of thing that I think the Calumet Heritage Partnership and and the Heritage Area Partner Organization should support. Um, uh, so, um, our feasibility study gives us some clues uh, about what such a museum might look might be about. Uh, and so I thought I'd share that with, with you. We have uh, three themes we came up with. Uh, we put together uh, people like you interested in the, um, in the rest of the region, and, uh, but also experts. And we asked basically, what is this, what is this region about? And we, we struggled with it. We uh, had, you know, like 20 different things about what this region was about. No one could agree. And then... But we kind of whittled it down. We kind of talked about what were the main things that make this region distinctive nationally and even internationally. And we came up with these three uh, themes. And the first one is nature. We worked Calumet's diverse landscape. And each of them has sub-themes, and you can see them, um, uh, see them there. Uh, but, you know, the, one of the words we used often to describe this region was juxtaposition, but that's a hard word for people to understand, apparently. So we, uh, we but the way we describe it is as nature rework. We, we have the, we have a uh, power plant, we have steel mill, and then we have the Indiana Dunes. We have nature and industry right next to each other. We have Marktown and we have industry. We have um, a patchwork of really interesting landscapes here in the Calumet region, and, and this is... So, and, and this is something that makes this place unique like no other. It, it's so unique it's hard to describe just exactly this quality. So this, this one of our, the expert panelists came up with this idea of nature we worked and we've, we've used it. So, um, so nature and the environment is a big theme. Another theme uh, is innovation and change for factories and workers. We have a really, really important industrial history, steel being really important, but also other industries in this region. Um, and in fact, when we sent our proposal into the National Park Service, they said, well, yeah, steel is important, but all this other stuff is important too. And so we actually expanded our discussion of uh, other industries. Uh, this is a really important industrial uh, center for the United States. But also uh, labor history. And, and the, 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 the is, is this, we have a really important story to tell as far as labor history here in uh, this region, uh, from Pullman to, um, I was thinking about uh, the uh, documentary by Christine uh, Wally, Exit Zero, this more contemporary labor history is really important too, and, and of course what's going on uh, today. And of course the, uh, 
uh, it says 21st century innovations, uh, the, the ongoing history. Uh, heritage areas are lived in and, and they are lived landscapes. So I think there's a big, lots of stories to tell about industry and labor uh, today as well, it's getting into green industry, information technology, that kind of thing. And then our last theme is a crucible of working uh, class and ethnic cultures, which actually uh, Christine Wally's um, Exit Zero actually fits into that too, uh, connects the two. Um, and so it's all the people who've been drawn to the region uh, uh, for industry and for nature and all this. Uh, we have a nationally significant story to tell about race relations and um, distinctive cultures and we have festivals and um, all this, all this, um, this, this wonderful culture, uh, working class and ethnic culture. So these are kind of the main stories that we think that we've determined from the feasibility study are the ones uh, that are nationally significant that we can tell. That doesn't mean that there aren't other stories. I mean, one of the things that comes up is transportation. We are the crossroads of America. Uh, there are Native American stories that need to be told. Uh, there are all kinds of stories that need to be told that don't necessarily fit in those. But th these provide us a nice framework to begin with uh, to tell our story. And I think they might uh, provide a pretty good starting point for a heritage museum, that, that, that uh, the story a, a museum might tell might uh, fit along these themes. Uh, another reason why CHP is interested in the question of museums is that uh, we also have a collection, um, the Acme Steel Collection. and. Uh, Diane over here is uh, chair of our collections committee and has worked, she's done work as an archivist working in the collection, trying to catalog it and um, figure out what we have and, and figure out its significance. And it turns out it is significant. We have some really, really important uh, documents and artifacts in our collection that are, exist nowhere else. Um, uh, but of course the problem is uh, we can't share it with anybody because we don't have a good place to uh, store it or display it. I mean, we, we have a place to store it, but it's not a place that's accessible to the public, and um, uh, we need to find a permanent home for it, and we, we're working to the extent that we can to find that uh, permanent home. Um, so this is, uh, this is part of our collection here, and uh, right now, you know. Um, uh, but uh, we did have one success story this year, uh, which was that we had three big artifacts in our collection, um, and... Um, uh, the uh, large uh, bell, the small bell, and then the ingot mold from the Acme Steel uh, plant, which we successfully gifted to the Chicago Park District and uh, relocated uh, thanks to the donation of, uh, uh, thanks to very generous donors uh, to uh, the uh, Steelworkers uh, Park. And uh, um, so that, that, that was a, a great accomplishment, I think. Uh, but there, there's a lot more to be done for the stuff that isn't so big. Um, as well. Um, I thought also I would talk a little bit about museums in general. So to think a little bit about uh, my own experience and thoughts about what makes a good museum. What might, what might a good museum be like? And so I'm thinking about a couple example museums. Uh, my, my favorite museums in some way. And I, I want to point to a couple. The Museum of London is one of them. Uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville is another. They're two different, they're two different museums. Uh, but they have a couple of things in common. One is they tell a really coherent story. And in fact, the story that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Museum of London tells is even present on its website. You, if you've been to the museum, the website reflects the museum. It tells a really coherent story about the city of London and its development from the Romans to, to today. And, um, uh, and that, that it, you can even see that on its website. Uh, the other thing to note about the Museum of London is it's not just a single site. There's an, a branch of it in the, in the Docklands area, which is a newly redeveloped area. That was where the East India Company had its docks and the, all the tea and stuff got unloaded there, and now it's redeveloped in kind of a second downtown for London. And so I think that, so the two things they have in common is they tell a really clear and memorable story, and the second, they're not limited to a single site. That a, so I want to suggest a little bit that our, we might be talking about not just a museum, but museums or a multi-site museum here uh, to uh, tell the story of the county map. Uh, my own favorite museum is the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville. Uh, when you go into this museum, uh, you, you go in, you have to take the elevator up to the top floor, and, um, and you, you, uh, you, you learn uh, the history of country music in a very 
uh, in a very, I think, engaging way. And, um, uh, and, and of course, they have all the artifacts, but they're also telling a, a very, uh, very a nice story. Uh, they're the kind of story that you would get as a scholar of, of country music reading a book or that kind of thing. I, it's a great way to, they do, their main, their main exhibit yeah, brings you through the history of, of country music uh, very nicely. I mean, it's very, very easily presented, but by the time you're, you're done, you'll know, you'll know uh, some of the big trends in country music. So if you don't know much about country music, you will when you, you leave this, and you'll see the artifacts and, and hear some of the music. So I think that's a... And then the other part about it, of course, it's a multi-site museum. Is They, have a, they uh, own and operate uh, Studio B, which is where Elvis and all kinds of famous people had their uh, recorded, and it's now operated as a uh, working studio uh, run in part by Belmont University, but they have, they have tours there as well. So again, a multi-site museum. Um, and, and of course, I'm also inspired, I think, uh, I made a visit to Quebec City, Canada. And it's an old town, it's a World Heritage Site. And uh, there, there's a series of linked museums. Uh, some part of the same organization, some not. And they all tell a coherent story about old town in, in Quebec City. And I'm, I was struck by the fact that, that I was through a day walking through uh, Quebec City that I was um, that I was there were multiple sites telling the same story and um, so I thought that was interesting this is one of the newest ones uh, uh, showing an archaeological dig under the um, the boardwalk uh, there in Quebec City so um, so and then lastly uh, uh, thinking about different forms of a museum I've been involved with the uh, Lakeshore People's Museum which uh, is, uh, is about helping people share their culture through events where they come and they share an artifact from their family, an heirloom or something like that, that tells a story, a uh, personal story related to the history of the place where they live. And um, it, doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't have a location, uh, but it is, uh, it is a way of, of but it's, a, it's done via a pop-up event. So it's a museum not as a place but as an event, which I think is a really innovative and interesting idea. Um, and uh, and uh, we had one test uh, test um, event, and uh, this is from that um, where people shared shared some heirlooms and uh, crafts and things uh, and and talked about them. And um, and uh, and and so that's I think another another model. So I think with that. I will uh, kind of conclude my comments, and, and we can go on to questions or other, yes, that's, other things. Um, yeah, I um, I worried about Pat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she how, gave no indication she was at. Oh, there she is. How could I be she worried about Pat? You just oh, had to see her name. Yes. Uh, um, so I'm going to stall Pat. Uh oh, perfect I'm timing. So sorry. Perfect timing. We're waiting for you just to start now. It, it's your turn <laughs> just to, to speak. I'm going to start at 6. Oh, I am so sorry. No, baby, okay. you're here. You're good. You're good. <laughs> you made it. Okay. Um, I don't know. Did anybody do any kind of PowerPoint or showing? Or yes. Anything? Did you have a... Well, I have some images, but I don't have to do those. I mean, it's not... I could do it. Yeah, the thumb drive. I do. I'll try to work it out. Okay. Mike and I will try to work it okay. out. Okay. To okay. All right. I am so sorry. First of all, I really apologize. I thought it started at six o'clock, um, for whatever reason. Okay, I'm glad to be here. Um, I don't know what's already been said, but my piece of this puzzle is that I was a documentary filmmaker who done local stories, uh, shifting sands, uh, uh, Kankakee Marsh story called Everglades in the North. Um, and what I found, and, and this is really why I think that we need a museum, is that in my research, I found that this area has such a unique history in, Ameri in American history, really. Naturally, culturally, and industrially. Naturally, first of all, because right here at the base of Lake Michigan is where three of the North American biomes meet. And so you have like an eastern deciduous forest that clashes into the prairies, you know, the, the, the beginnings of the prairie. And then you have the northernmost region of where the southern plants grow, like prickly pear cactus. And because of the glaciers, 
You have Arctic plants that grow here too. So you had this really unique ap ecosystem that was nowhere else in the world. That right here you could find a cactus growing next to an Arctic bearberry, or you could find sand dunes and marshes together and the, the different types of plants that grew there. So first of all, Mother Nature blessed us, okay? With this, this really unique history, natural history here. Um, secondly, because of that unique natural history, we're also the crossroads of America in, industrially and culturally. So right here at the base of Lake Michigan were some of the largest industrial hubs in the world. You know, some of the largest industrial organizations in the world, U.S. Steel Corporation, um, uh, Standard Oil Company, they all came here. And because of that, then culturally, it brought people from around the world as well and from around the country. So you had everything kind of collided right here at the base of Lake Michigan, which is really what, when we talk about having a cultural or um, um, Calumet region historical area or a cultural hub that's what we're looking at i think we've got something that's really special here and i always thought think big you know i think walking into this gorgeous museum with a big rotunda that has all these you know this natural history and these wonderful images so my coworker just walked in tom dash raise your hand tom tom co-produced all these films that we're going to talk about but while we researched them we found in small little archives and large archives like the Calumet archives at, at the, in the library at Indiana University has 10,000 images of the beginnings of U.S. Steel or the, the moving of the Grand Calumet River or you go to West Chester Historical Society in Chesterton, Indiana and you're going to find this little museum that has this amazing archive of the pageant of the Indiana Dunes <laughs> and so many glorious pictures that I never saw before in my life. Or you go to Moments, <coughs> Illinois, and you found these wonderful little images of what the, Calumet, the Grand Kankakee Marsh was before it was drained and dredged. Um, and, and we need to bring all these together. This is our heritage, and I think that you know it's just really important that we talk about this tonight. And I'd like to show you some of those images, if I can. I don't know where your laptop's at. Um, it's over here, where do you want me to go? Uh, okay, well, let's start with um, the US Steel ones. Okay. Okay, so, you know, here's people going to work every day. My father was from the steel mills. I'm a third generation steel worker. I worked in the steel mills before I came into this. So a lot of this I can really relate to, people going to work every day. Um, keep, keep on going. Yeah, this is this is an image which is really interesting to me when they were first making U.S. Steel the Gary Works and the dredging, and I thought these archives are these they just had these beautiful historical photos that were shot on glass slides. Okay, you can keep going, and here you know this just shows immigrants who came from all over. Could be my grandfather, could be yours, could be a great grandfather, a cousin, an uncle. This is when they dredged and. To, to move the Grand Calumet River in order to make U.S. steel. Okay, keep going. Another one of the dredging of that. Um, of course, a big ladle of steel. You know, that's a perfect image for industrialization here. Next. This one is one of my favorites, and it's kind of a bad image right now. But I look at this guy, and I see my dad working midnights. <laughs> I see the dark circles under his eyes when he poured his coffee to go out the door to work at U.S. Steel. I see my husband coming home from Acne Steel Coke plant with still Coke dust on it in his ears and on the side of his eyes. You know, to me, these, pe these pictures speak. And when you blow this up, this is a great image. The crane, the hook for the crane is as tall as that man, so you know how heavy that industrial ladle was. But this is our history. Um, you can keep going. So these were these images were when they were building U.S. Steel. So can you imagine? This was all just sand, sand dunes. Keep going. And um, we we'll come back to that. Okay, we can get out of U.S. Steel for right now. So I just wanted to give you a little taste of some things. All right, the next one, if you could go to Indiana Dunes. Okay, so here are some beautiful images of the dunes before some of it was taken away to create Bethlehem steel. You know, this was just no, mother nature creating beauty. 
Um, here was a group of people um, called the Prairie Club. They were early environmentalists. You know, like you had the Sierra Club, but we had the Prairie Club in the Midwest. And they fought to save the Indiana Dunes from destruction. They saw, you know, industrialization coming in and they wanted to do something about it. Okay, you can keep. Um, this one's kind of hard to see, but this is part of that pageant that they did. These women dressed up like the wind and the waves and the sand, and they, you know, they did these dances. And this was in 1916 to try to, um, to create a national park here on our shoreline. You can keep going. There's another one. They were dancing on the beach. They had a pageant where 50,000 people came out to the Indiana Dunes and to see a play, basically, because there was no television, there was no radio. So these, these images are in the Westchester Historical Society, and they're amazing. And there's hundreds of them, and I just, I love them. I love all of them, and I would have never known this had I not been a, you know, a researcher for documentary film. I would have never known these images existed there. And that's another one they were doing a play on the dunes. And this is part of the Prairie Club. They would hike. These women would hike in these long dresses <laughs> in the heat and up the sand dunes. Can you imagine that? And just the beauty, you know, the beauty of our dunes. A lot of these were shot in black and white. And some of the history of the, the saving. You got Mayor Daly there, Dorothy Buell, the people who fought save the dunes. You know, this was in the 60s now, but our history is here. We have a rich environmental history, too right here in Northwest Indiana. Another one of the pageant. And Paul Douglas, of course, he stood on these shores and he said, you know, in my life, when I was young, I wanted to save, um, save the world, that I just wanted to save my country. Now I just want to save the Indiana Dunes. <laughs> and this was some of the sand mining that was going on in the early days to make glass ball glass jars and other things they would mine sand from the dunes. Some more beauty pictures of the dunes. And that's right back to where we started. Okay, and if we could go to the next one, which is Everglades. Okay, that would, this would be the um, Kankakee Marsh. This is the hunting, you know. These were the hunters and fishermen. Um, these were early Early settlers who lived lived off the Grand Kankakee Marsh. This is down by Balms Bridge, they call it, where they had hunt clubs where Lou Wallace um, fished and hunted along the Grand Kankakee Marsh. Um, this is early, you know, early hay and farming days along the Grand Kankakee Marsh. Dredging. This is dredging the old river. There's some amazing photos like this. These dredges were huge. People lived off of them as they were going through, bit by bit, moving to dredge a section into, it's basically what we look at now is a straight drainage ditch, but it was once one of the largest in the marshes in all of North America at a, the southernmost border of the Calumet region. This is a great picture of Dunn's Bridge, which some people say was made from some of the steel of the World's Fair. I don't know if that's true or where exactly it came from, but that was, it, it's, the bridge is still there. <laughs> Early Schneider, Indiana. So you've got, these were just archives that we found so many cool pictures in. Some more early farming. Ah, I love this one. This was an old glass slide of just young boys fishing on the Kankakee River from fishing poles. They probably made themselves a, a young kid in the middle of corn. Oh, and this was one of our presidents who came down to hunt and fish, Benjamin Harrison on the Kankakee River. They say he got lost and he almost didn't make it to become president, <laughs> but he was found again. <laughs> but presidents came to hunt and fish there because it was the place to, to shoot ducks. <laughs> so, and these were more, they said they would take the ducks out by wagon loads or if, um, if you were paddling in your boat, you didn't even need a gun. You could just lift your paddle and knock out three ducks because they would black in the sky. That's how much wildlife was here. Some more of the early hunters. Another dredge on the Kankakee River. The tents they, they used to set up. I was telling my coworker, Tom, look at this. He's got a bed in there. <laughs> that was like glamping back in the day. <laughs> Glamorous camping. But they would come and hunt and fish and they'd be there for a long time. 
oh, this one I love. It was, it was actually an early train depot, you know, train stop. But I just, you could look in his eyes, you could see what was he thinking that day, you know? Um, it's just these, these wonderful images, these glass slides held every little detail. But I think this, all these images, there's tens of thousands of them. They need a place to live. They need a place to come alive and not be hidden under in shelves and, you know, in archives. But one place that we could all kind of discover our history. And again, I apologize for being late. I thought it started at 6. <laughs> <laughs> where, wow. Where, where was the train stop? Uh, um, that, that train stop, I believe, was near, it, it was in... Southern Indiana, I think it was like Lowell, the southernmost point of our Calumet region. I want to say it was around Lowell area, but I don't know the exact detail on that one. I just thought it to be an amazing image. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. No. That was really nice. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for allowing me the time. Uh, it's very inspirational. But Thank you. Um, Thanks. I have a question, a uh, couple of questions to ask the panel, and then uh, let me go first, and then anyone else that has a, a question uh, can follow. Me. But um, uh, the question is, what should a regional heritage museum provide for Calumet residents? And I think we've gone through some of this, but could you answer the question? I'm narrowly focused on getting the video. The events like this that are live because too frequently we read a newspaper account that gives us three sentences about what was said in the hour or so that we've been talking here. It doesn't really get it. So we're trying to capture the live part of it and I think that's an important aspect of it but as you know and as you know Pat, we have limitations. We can't cover everything so until everybody starts documenting it's always going to be fragmentary. We've been talking for years to other groups about Get your people out, you know, record it. If you want to share it, fine, but at least get the records. Get get the action, find out what people are doing, what they're saying, how they're feeling. Get the, you know, get the entire event as much as you can. And so that's pretty much what we're focused on, and that's what I would want to make sure that is included in it. And certainly that's not the totality of what a museum should include. But it's, I think, an important part about the human dimension in action. We, we get too many times, we get snippet, as I was saying about the recorded history. I couldn't even put together my own material after a few years, and I'm the guy that created it. It's was like, what was I thinking then? I thought, God and I knew at the time, now only God knows. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a series of questions. What kind of museum uh, do we need? How should it function? Would it be a physical space, a consortium, or a virtual? I can, let me speak to that a little bit. Um, I think I think there are a bunch of different options for a museum. Um, the uh, I think we absolutely need physical space. I see we need uh, space uh, for archives uh, and places to store. So we've got lots of uh, lots of organizations that have stuff that need better places to store stuff and uh, need places to display it. So I think we absolutely do need physical locations uh, in the kind of, this is a, just a need uh, for a lot of organizations and if that can be even at Central Museum, that would be great. Um, so we do need a, a physical space, but I think a virtual museum is also a good idea. Uh, so I think uh, having, having something online as part of a museum, I think maybe that's the way we transition into a physical museum. Is, is we have a lot of organizations putting stuff online and, and so I think that might even be a, a strategy. Um, uh, we might get into the question, the last question about where where it is. But I also think that um, the question is: is it just one museum, or is it? Are we talking museums? Are we talking about a consortium of museums that work together and provide some common resources, common spaces, that kind of thing? Are we talking about a, a museum that has more than one site? And, uh, which is why I highlighted the two ones uh, that I did that are not that to say that a museum doesn't have to be just just one place that there can be multiple sites to a museum. So I think those are some of the, the questions. Okay. 
tell. What are the other questions? Actually, I have something that I've been working on for a while, um, and it's actually currently in file. We're talking about the space for archives, and one of the issues that you run into archives is actually knowing what other places have and what you even have in your own culture. I have boxes in my archives that have not been opened for years because I don't the time or the resources to do it. And when we talk about museums and archives, we're always talking about a short of, shortage of funds, a shortage of manpower, a shortage of, of physical space. Um, when I started as the archivist for Purdue Calico Met, one of the things I was tasked with was creating an archive of Purdue Go Central. So I had to merge two archives together without reinventing the wheel. Then I started a partnership with the Parker Mansion in Michigan City where they were started in our job. And what we did was assist with undergraduate student help and for them to use our institutional repository so they would have somewhere to post their findings. So right now I've got two locations with, or I physically have two locations with three repositories of my own and a fourth repository in Michigan City. Having a place online where researchers can look at the Calumet region and find a listing of all the historical societies, all the museums, all the archives, and all the finding aids, so you can go in and you know find different, like all the photographs. You might not be able to have the photographs online as an actual physical item, but if you can describe that item and say what you have in what box at what location and form a consortium for the entire Calumet region where everybody can put their finding aids in as they get processed, that will give one very large, robust, searchable database for what everybody in the area has, whatever that area is defined as. So if you need material for research, you know where that material is here it is in one box at what place in the area. Uh, there's low-cost software that can do that for you. It's hosted. Um, plus, using, you know, there's a lot of institutional repository software that can be hosted. It's not terribly expensive that an entire group can put together and really have this in a centralized location virtually. I think knowing what everybody has, you know, you, you, you build the building after you know what to put in the building. If we don't know what we actually have as a whole, we can't plan ahead on what we would need. So that, I think, just had to be know what that would be. Is it adequate to what he's talking about? A lot of the software <coughs> programs that are available for being able to do that kind of thing, like Archivist Toolkit, are priced in such a way that it's better if you can have a group of places, group of small places go together and do a subscription together so that they can keep a site going like he's talking about. Mine's fully hosted. I don't have to touch anything. We can add all the information we want. It's just for me. I pay about a thousand dollars a year. And frankly, it's kind of that yeah. If I took the time and first all the photographs off of it, which again, I don't have time to do, but as it gets larger and larger, you can up these subscriptions. Um, I just digitized 1,100 newspapers over the past year, we've had, since October, we've had 2,800 hits on it. Um, and that's on perpetually posted site. So getting that information out and making sure that people know what they have would sort of dictate whether you have a central location, whether it's a consortium of different groups, that would be kind of a way to approach it. Sorry for rambling. I think I'm Other question? All of us are rambling because this is a huge subject. I've chosen since the beginning of the world to small on this public business to be a, a, a one man operation. I run 15 local history of great books, but it taught me a lesson to scan. I'm currently scanning all the stuff that I did with a robust plumbing. 
probably more people like me who are doing it themselves. I'm glad to see Blue Island here because uh, the God is it seems the Chinese region does extend well into that other state where we all get back. Um, and it's such it's such a big region, this historical region. When I worked at National Parks trying to do this area of the corridor in 1985, so I uh, mean this is really big. So our man here uh, has raised the question of do we need multiple sites? And it kind of has to be. If we pick something right in the center, we can write about Cherville, um, I think we from Chicago, and Michigan City, and Indianapolis going to come here. The problem is defining the region. And I think that uh, Alfred Meyer's map, your predecessor, actually got to talk to the old man in 72. Um, it kind of goes from Marlin Mall to Mall in Michigan City. How do we define the Martin and then the county kind of Stephen Douglas is also pretty good. Defines the watershed. How far south of the coast is the library of Martin County? You've got to stop somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful as that movie is. For Route 30, in the five, you kind of have to look at watershed, which is really ecological, to determine a 21st century undertaking by a 10,000 year old record. It kind of unites us. And, uh, the digital archive thing, you get one scan per box. I started making find the aid for the Coleman archive that spread worldwide since the dissolution of the company in 81. I need to find the aid for my find the aid. That one company has got such a, a, a archival footprint. That one company is too big. The dummy steel industry as a whole is too huge. Um, that 10,000 in U.S. Steel's collection, I think another 10,000 in um, what was what would have been considered the Inland Steel collection, uh, and now our Mill. In the last 16 years that the Chicago Experimental Society, yeah. uh, I, I saw this map <laughs> from 40 to 140, and collections, uh, no sooner was the new building built than the one collection hold it, the offside storage is just uh, it almost becomes unmanageable. So the big question is who's paying for all this effort? Because you can't have museums without museums. Um, it could be Debbie Down. No, I mean, I, I think that's a good question. It's huge. If we, were, you know, I think we start, like these gentlemen here were saying, that you start with something virtual maybe to start pulling it together. but. You know, I think big things come in big dreams. Who dreamt of the Field Museum, you know, and who paid for it? Marshall Field, you know. This area, I mean, you've got BP, you know. I mean, I don't know. They've taken a lot environmentally from this area. Maybe they should pay some back. You know, maybe we should get some big sponsors to sponsor a big museum. But until um, there was uh, the digital world, we didn't have a way to call collections make them available. If you wanted to go to Madison to see the collection, you had to book a room, you had to go up there, and you had to make Xeroxes. God, the Xerox is terrible. Um, but now we have this digital access. I have access to more stuff than any of the historians in the 1950s did, you know, because I'm on Ancestry, I'm on, uh, you know, I'm on the digital newspaper forms. Just for instance, Poland's been studied forever. We're still finding new stuff on Poland. Um, I'm not a Poland-centric guy. I think the Caribbean region is the most important to a, a spot in the country right now. Um, and our phrase is, we are the heart of the heartland. Mm -hmm. Chewing that one around for about a year or so. Uh, you go on with that. I'll let somebody else ramble. But Blue Island, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> You and me were still part of the guy in the I agree. Well, <laughs> I actually remember you left the comments about um, my Ferdinand Shocker post about uh, four months ago. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're Facebook. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, otherwise, the local scholars are lonely individuals up in the library tower for a year. We usually just want to eat. It's a nice addition. Yeah. Ferdinand yeah. um, Shocker. 
in that chapter was the one man we be in. He was uh, the, the son of Blue Island's uh, first apothecary, and as such, really the only drugstore within 50 miles of any way. And the, his job was to deliver the prescriptions to these old guys when they didn't show up. And I think about it then, the they didn't pick up their prescription, but they were dead. So he, he gave me notes, and all of a sudden he assembled <laughs> notes of all these old timers, and he wrote a book called Southern Cook County Before the Civil War. Hundreds and hundreds of entries. Um, it is so thorough, it makes other regions go, yeah, I wish we had him. Um, but the Canada regions got Thomas Paul, who very early started collecting stuff for Lake County. The Alpo's done a great job. Alfred Meyer kind of invents regional geography studies. Um, we kept the goods, and thank God for digital, and we can share them. But museums are still a hard slot. This giving up funding, we have the last more than two generations of need an endowment. Practical brick and mortar problems with museums. So maybe we need three regional museums that have fine gates to Westchester, to Lowell. Um, there's some great archives out there, but there's only a 24 hour communication. Mm -hmm. That's my rambling. Anybody else want to ramble? Sure. I'm going to ramble on behalf of the <laughs> So, um, at the Blue Island Library in the basement, which is called the Annex. Michael, I this amazing room. And um, it, it has quilts and archival photographs and all kinds of stuff posted around the wall. And interspersed with them are um, digital instruments computers and scanners and all kinds of stuff. And it's very much a maker space combined with archives. And and I would love for all of us to go over there and experience it. It is, but it's not but it's not well known. And it is a magical important resource for makers. And that is something to consider as well when we're talking about archives and museums and what Paul is talking about, the, um, the do-it-yourself. When, when it's not being done in the museum setting, how do we do it ourselves and how do we bring it together as resources? And the space in the island is wonderful. It's something that we could perhaps include in this conversation as we create a, a type of museum in China. I think that kind of speaks to the is for the business is it's a great setting for architects and engineers. as I would like it to be right it's a uh, it's it's a nice interactive um but the Albion was a second generation so we can call it so we decided to do this for many years they left it to us and we kind of carried out some conditions they had plus you know I just want to say real quick, some of the conversations that I've had with um, people on my side of the state of Hawaii, there is a, a bit of that disconnect. They don't, they don't seem to see the, the, the worth of coming over here and talking about this when they're really concerned about what's going on. I, I see that connection being an important thing, but it doesn't really exist as much that way.
probably, you know, revealing yet another layer that we have to worry about. Yep. Because, <laughs> and within the, the, in the city, and too, trying to get people to be aware that there was a few maritime history there. There's so many phenomenal museums and institutions in Chicago. It's kind of hard to fight for attention. Yeah, obviously, Long Beach Bed became an amazing maritime center. You mentioned something about being in one location or having that, you know, how it, finding things and having this, you know, you don't have many remnants left of, of shipping and stuff. I had thought years ago that I was going to write something about the uh, LTV, it used to be LTV, steel mill about the history of it. But I started looking for information. You can find tons of stuff about U.S. Steel because uh, the Calumet Regional Archives has a lot of information. So I asked my father, who's for some reason still at our sort of middle, even in the mid 60s and retired, can't give up that sweet mill overtime. So I had asked him, you know, when he hired in, he said, oh, you mean when I hired into Youngstown, then like, and then JL, then LTV, then. <laughs> So it's been bought and sold so many times, and you go searching for the information for it, and what place has what history of it. Nobody has anything, because it got transferred here. Oh, there's something about LTV for 10 years over in, somewhere in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, what about the holding company? Oh, no, they threw all that crap away because they sold it off, they didn't care. So just having the information, and then knowing where to find it, having something simple for who oh, you actually have, boxes of stuff that I might need, knowing that you have boxes of stuff. Can sometimes be really not even knowing where you to find something that's changed that many times can be problem. Are, are you talking about the one on hundred sixteenth and Avenue L? The old Republic Steel that went to L T V or are you talking about L T V in Indiana? Yeah, L T V Harbor. Indiana Harbor. Harbor, okay. Indiana Harbor. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the other one is 116th and Avenue right. Right. and there is a Facebook site, that's what I was going to tell you, yeah. where a lot of a lot of people who work there, myself included, have just, like, dumped, dumped stuff in okay. old pictures and connecting, and so that there, there's that, too, and you're right, I, I haven't, well, that might be in the southeast side historical society, a lot of the old Republic Steel stuff, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, so but that, certainly, certainly. that was turned into LTV, yeah. It, but it's interesting about underwater, right? Before you went to the maritime, uh, have we done much on that? Not really, and there is some really cool stuff. I mean, there really is. Yeah. 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 Might be added to it. Right. Yeah. Well, that's thing, a really like good volatility is, a, is an issue. We have, it reminds me of, sorry, I'm a past president of the Southeast Chicago Historical Society, and the premier president, Frank Stanley, uh, and I had been searching for years for all of the documentation that residents in Southeast Chicago had given to Columbia College, to Jim Martin's project for creating the movie Wrapped in Steel. And we chased rumors all over the place. It's in this basement. It's in that bank building. It's behind this tree stump. And we chased it for years. We couldn't find it. We went to the South Chicago Bank, which seemed like the best. And they had the, what was it, the one set of photographs. Yeah, so they just had one set of photographs posted on the wall. They said, we don't know what you're talking about in terms of archives. So we sort of gave up. This had gone on for years. And one morning, Saturday morning or Sunday morning, I don't know which, it was like a Mission Impossible thing. I got a call from Frank. He says, I found it. I said, okay, where? He said, it's at Columbia College, and it's going to be on the street in a few hours if we don't pick it up. They're going to dump it all because they don't have room for it, and the project's dead. So when he says, I've got a dump truck from the park district, and I'm ready, what do you think? We went. Mm -hmm. So we hit Columbia College that morning, pulled the dump truck up next to the building, and unloaded everything into this open dump truck with the skies just clouding up over the building, saying, I'm going to wash all this stuff away before you get to the park. It did. It just threatened us all the way. We loaded up a full dump truck, and much of the museum's stock was in that truck. 
And if we hadn't gotten that call and hadn't had the opportunity to do it, and I'm still not sure how Frank got that information, um, it would have been lost. People had donated trustingly, and a project died, and off it, off it goes. We had a similar thing later when a Chicago policewoman called from uh, down around the Flying Saucer on the lake, uh, Soldier's Field, and said, you've got to get out here now because there's stuff in the dumpster that's important, and it was. And it, we, somebody else, I don't remember the details, but got that call and went down and saved that stuff. So it, the volatility of these things is important. And also keeping track of where they are, who's got them. Who, we loaned some stuff out from the Eastland to another museum, and we needed to know where that was. So fortunately, we kept records, but it's important to keep those records. We're worried, too, about the very facility that we have. It was sort of an act of kindness from a neighbor who happened to be in charge of the park district at the time, that section of the park district, gave us museum space. Somebody else downtown could snap their fingers, we're gone. Where do we go? Where does it go? All of these things have to be considered when we're putting a museum in. It's Walter. Well, I could give some information about uh, the old LTV, and it was Youngstown mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, but uh, LTV in 1982 purchased the middle portion of the old 2500 building south of here that was uh, demolished a few years ago. Right. Well, they first rented space for office and uh, training operations, and then they purchased the building and had it for a number of years. The resource right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we want to keep this going? Are people getting tired? Do they want to go home? Yeah. It was this a good idea to get together? Yeah. Right? Don't talk to one another. Yeah. We brought this up that uh, we kind of know each other. Uh, this is being uh, videotaped, and uh, it will be on uh, our website, and uh, it will be on your website. So um, if you forget a person's name or something, um, and you're trying to, you, you might just check on those two websites and, and figure out who was at the at the meeting. Um, but I, I just want to mention one thing. I um, the uh, I was at the very first meeting of the uh, Calumet Heritage Partnership. Uh, as an organization, it was the founding meeting, and that was sometime in 1998, maybe 97. So um, we started this a long time ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. to me anyway, and yeah. it, and it's and but it's kept going. And so um, um, uh, if you don't try, you know, um, and if you give up, you're not going to get there. But I seems to me that there's a lot of people in this room right now that um, wants to keep it going. So um, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming this evening. And uh, if you have any comments or anything, uh, you can just uh, email Ollie or, uh, or Mike or some, someone here on the panel. And, and, um, question, Mike. Uh, question. Is this going to drop it now? Oh, well, <laughs> no, we have all these groups that are meeting. Yeah, I know, but uh, we don't have to there's no the museum way. group meeting. <laughs> well, do we, we want to start it? Do we want to start well, a museum group? Go for it. We could do that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I've been hearing about this for a year. And I've never gotten any emails about it. There's been no discussion online, and this was the first time anybody actually sat down and talked about it. And is this it? I don't know. This is. I mean, at, at the end of a meeting, you should sort of have a plan of action, like when are we going to get together, or who's going to get together, what are we going to talk about? And don't look Point. at me. I'm well, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and as I understand it, there are these different groups that are meeting that um, um, and then you're suggesting maybe once a year all the groups should get together up for well, I didn't think well, there was a group working on a museum. Let, let's um, I think well, there's a couple ways we could do this. I think one of the ways to do it is to um, 
I saw Julie taking notes. The Calumet um, Curators Group uh, is a group of museums meeting together. And maybe that's where some, I think uh, the discussion particularly about, um, that you brought up about uh, finding aids to get, I mean, you started with what are the places and you've, we've created a really cool guide to uh, museums which is uh, being uh, a draft form now. But I think maybe the next step of that is exactly what you said. What are, what's in the collections of, of places regionally and can we create a finding aid? I think that's probably the next step. Uh, but maybe that, maybe, um, I think I think the goal for the Calumet curators is to become a formal, um, is to incubate into a consortium of museums, and maybe that's where we get our ultimate museum, if the Calumet Heritage Museum. Perhaps I think that's the um, I think that's the best path forward. Or we could start another group, but I think it might be the same people. So yeah. Um, if you need a, a page, or if you have your own website, terrific. If you need a page, I can put a page up for your curators group. Oh, we're working on a website. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Okay, so that, that's really good. What you guys, what you and, and Joanne have been doing for years has been amazing, just documenting all this. And without these guys, I'm, I don't know <laughs> where I'd be lost, I know, because I find so much of my information on what you did. And I, oh, good, I yeah. thank you, and I thank all of you in this room for all that work you do behind the scenes that nobody ever sees but I see when I go to research or if you're writing a book I'm sure you do the same thing um, so okay we've got a, a, a group that's already meeting to organize all the the stuff that should be kind of in a museum yeah. or where the museums are all right so on another level and this is the level I think about sometime is do we talk to our local congressmen and things? Do we say we want a bigger place with more money that we can invest in to find a home for this? You know, is there a political segment of this group that says that pushes for that? Where is the Calumet Heritage Program corridor program right now? Has it been Well, I mean another another thing we could do is make a museum a right. goal of the heritage area. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Our, That's our, our yeah. Okay. So we are. Um, I am talking with our our Congress uh, men and women. Okay. Um, but I think uh, we we have to be in a coordinated plan. Right. We need to be a coordinated group to not just hey, uh, Congressman Kozlowski. I think we should have a museum. I think we really need to show that we're really well organized. The curators are doing their thing. There's um, archivists that are doing other things. Mm -hmm. really, but I think. Museum is entirely appropriate yeah. mm -hmm. for, for, that, for, for a heritage area to have as a central yeah, hub. Yeah, a guy. central hub, and then buses could go to, you know, Blue Island or Pullman and, you know, take people to Dunes and other places. Yeah. Like the Whiskey Trail in Kentucky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all in, it's kind of be a bit of a pedant real quick, yeah, though, yeah. because we're talking about museums and we're talking about archives using those kind of interchangeably they're very different. and they're very they different are. things so because of the space and the management of archives perhaps you have one group for curators one group for archives we can get all of our ducks in a row meet together and kind of see what each other is doing but if you have curators working on archives and archives working Museum stuff that can be problematic. I don't have much. Yeah. A lot of archivists we don't have experience with. Um, well, we we could 
we could start an archivist group too. Uh, that was a suggestion, but that never materialized. What did materialize was a broader group of, and we also thought about doing an arts group. But I think what what materialized was the, um, with the most enthusiasm was the uh, was the um, was the uh, museums and, and history centers and and, and small museums. Uh, that group, the Calumet Curators. Our former name was a network of museums, galleries, and local history centers in the Calumet region, and we were asked to shorten that. <laughs> well, I didn't ask you. I, 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 I like it. That's how we asked you. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, but there's that. And then I guess another point I could say is that museums and archives often go together. And one, o one other thing I would mention about um, the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame is it's really both. Uh, there's a big, in fact, the archive takes up more space than the museum. It's a big hunk and archive, and then there's a little bit of a museum around yeah. it. So, yeah, go ahead. Has anybody been to New Orleans to see the World War II museum? That's another good one you can see. Yeah. yeah. The world behind the Worldwide. Yeah, it's the number one museum. Unbelievable. And they don't have archives, but they do have a wonderful place. Yeah. And they're expanding into a Holocaust museum this year. It's, it's been two days there. But when you go in, you get a set of dog tags, and you follow one of five GIs through the war. And as you go into an exhibit, it starts on a Pullman train that's a troop train. Mm -hmm. And you begin to go down to you go to Germany, Pacific Theater. You know, when you talk about two different museums, I know it's a huge, I mean, uh, one museum is a huge thing because we're Illinois and Indiana, and I know that's, there's a lot of divides and things, but there's a lot, naturally, we come together. Wolf Lake sits right in the middle <laughs> of the dividing line between Illinois and Indiana. Is there any location, Michael, that you think of near Wolf Lake that could cross the two, that they could cross the state line and we could actually have, you know, Nope. Isn't there an old railroad track down the yeah. state line? Ah, see, that would be perfect. Exactly. Right there behind the trailer court, there's an old well, that, railroad that's track. Not so far fetched. Years ago, the South Shore, uh, there was a group, Bob Harris, I think his name was, okay. with a bunch of the cars and stuff, and he wanted to put together a South Shore Museum. And the group, the advisory group, finally came up with this idea of a 90 mile museum. And you would have all you know, yeah. stations, I suppose, all the way across. Yeah. yeah. You would have had little museums or kiosks or something. It never happened, but it's a, to me, it sounded like a good idea. Yeah. And I want to point out that the without the Kankakee River Valley, right, the Calumet, the Calumet watershed is 600 square miles. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot of museums. Yeah. That's just up to like Crown Point, Valparaiso, to the Marine. Yeah. Yeah. And our region's bigger than that. Well. Yeah, there's a number of different places I can think of, you know, where the old Edison plant was, but I think that's being bought up now by a huge computer company or something. It's gone. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> then there's the old uh, railroad station in Gary where they're doing the outside of the building, but it would take a lot of money to really fix that up. But that would be cool. You could stand right there and look oh, at the steel it's mills. It's a beauty if they could do it. Yeah, if they could do it. Um, and you can get on the train and go to Pullman or go the other way to Michigan City, and you know you can do the stops along the, the train. Um, but something that would be right here that would actually cross, or maybe it's Calumet College. <laughs> Who knows? You know, we well, ask in the well, universities. Well, I'll have to talk to uh, Amy about that. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Got all kinds of ideas. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Calumet College is the only university within the Wolf Lake watershed. Yeah. yeah. You know so maybe it's an extension so of the college. college. Mm -hmm. So. Okay.
You know, there's an app. I have it on my phone. It's called the Field Trip app. So as I'm driving anywhere I go, it bings, and it's like, oh, this is the house of so and so, or this was the place of this. So it's really interesting to me, as kind of a, a historian in some way, that I, anywhere I go and across the country, it'll bing and tell me what's interesting along the way. But maybe we could have an app. We talked about apps too. Oh, okay. I'm. I'm s no, we don't. I don't have that. Okay. I don't want to find out about the one that you're talking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could show it to you on my phone, but before we go. Yeah. Okay, we've run out of ideas. No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tom, do you have anything? Because you, Tom's from Hyde Park, and he's done so much research with me on all these documentaries, and nothing, Dad. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of American Home. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Tom did American Home, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Tom did the history. It's called An American Home, if you haven't seen it. It's about the Frank Lloyd Wright House, the the Bradley House in Kankakee, in Kankakee Illinois. Oh. And so he does a wonderful history, and it's available through Lakeshore Public Television. Just down with the Calumet. So. Yeah, or it's on Amazon, too, right? It's on, yeah. You, you can it's down, down, yeah. That's Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I was thinking of as you were talking about locations and museums was something that we're talking about the Her Calumet Heritage Corridor. I think when we're talking about this, and I was thinking that our experiences have been with the CNO Canal, National C Heritage Corridor. And there were museums along the way, uh, situated, because it runs from D.C. all the way to the, well, to the practically to West Virginia. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't quite jump across, but it followed the, uh, the canals right to the end of the line. And then, of course, the railroads beat them out and so it didn't quite cross out of out of Maryland but uh, it covered all of Maryland in that process and there are many interesting sites and they have small museums related to aspects of the route and and the region around it as you travel the road this is one of the reasons we became interested in when somebody said Calumet Heritage Corridor we're thinking oh CNO yeah we we could do that you know and so it sounds like there could be definitely physically specific sites along the way that would relate to the, that part of the region in an important way, with some of its like and, and the, some of the different uh, transit points that they had, some of them were amazing in terms of what they had to go through, and there would be a lot of information regarding those things with models frequently that were quite impressive of what they were talking about. So that would be an aspect that we could certainly consider. And I still say, think big. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah. I just, uh, before uh, we uh, depart, I want to uh, remind everybody that our the next kind of revisited forum will be Tuesday, January 8th. And it's going to be in room 265 on the uh, uh, same floor, uh, different direction. And uh, that will be Natalie Johnson, who's uh, executive director of Save the Doom. And she'll be speaking on the uh, organization's history and its current work. And then it's the uh, following forum on February 5th uh, with uh, Field trip Larry McClellan yeah. and trip Any Amy Reagan. Any place I pass. On well, thank you very much for coming tonight. With respect to the video, we usually get it finished in about two days, so certainly by Friday or the weekend it should be out on YouTube of this event. Yeah.